to destroy the works. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. This program is brought to you by the Churches of Christ. We now invite you to open your Bibles and your minds as we present the Gospel of Christ. And now, Ben Bailey. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James chapter 2, verse number 17. Welcome to our study of the book of James. James is all about the practical nature of Christianity. It's about being doers of the word, not hearers only. James chapter 1, verse number 22. In chapter 1, we notice to be doers of the word, we've got to have a Christianity that faces trials, that controls the tongue, and that tries to help others who are in need. Now chapter 2 will teach us about the real nature of of our faith. James deals with two points related to faith. First, as we think about the Christian and his faith, it cannot be prejudiced. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, James will say in James 2, verse 1, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with prejudice or partiality. God's not concerned about some of the things we elevate today and the way we view certain people based on their status in life. And then, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 will teach us that a true faith must, absolutely must be combined with works to be effective and a faith that honors Almighty God in each and every day. Now, let's talk a little bit first of all about what faith is. In the scripture, faith is or could be defined as trust in God based on His Word. The Bible says it is indeed a necessity. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so I know first and foremost that faith is a necessity. I've got to have it to please God. How do I get faith? Romans 10 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so I get it from the Bible, from the Word of God, as I study about God, as I learn about His nature, as I watch His dealings with man and how that He's always been faithful, I can put my trust in God. And then we learn by example. Like in Hebrews chapter 11, what faith really is. The Bible says of the people in the days of Joshua, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd encircled the city. Now, what is faith there? Well, think about that example. Here you have the people and they're marching around the city and God tells them, march around once a day on six days. On the seventh day, march seven times, blow the trumpet, shout, stomp, do all those things. Now, was it just their belief in God that was faith there? No, it's combined with action. They had to march. They had to do it seven times the seventh day. They had to shout. They had to blow the trumpet. They had to stomp. Well, did all that make the walls fall down? No, it was their faith. But real faith is always trust that causes one, that motivates one to obey God and do His will. Christians often sing the song, trust and obey. That's the idea. Trust and obedience are not diametrically opposed to each other. They go hand in hand with each other. In the opening verses of this book, James will teach us that our faith cannot be prejudiced or partial to people maybe we like or we don't like. Notice again James chapter 2, verse number 1. The scripture records, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. As God's people, we've got to realize there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female. Uh, we're all one in Christ. Galatians 2, verse 29. Unlike Jonah, who was extremely prejudiced. God sent Jonah. God, God gave Jonah the, the message, the command, go to Nineveh and preach to him. Jonah got on the boat and went the opposite way. He hated those people. He was prejudiced when he did go and preach to them. And when they responded, Jonah got mad and went outside the city and sulked. Why? He was very, very prejudiced against the Assyrians, the Ninevites of that day. 
And so we can't be prejudiced with the gospel based on other things that might cause us to be that way. For example, sometimes we look at things that God's not at all concerned about. God's not concerned with skin color. God's not concerned with ethnicity. God's not concerned with money. Uh, God's not concerned with men more than women. God's not concerned whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. What's God concerned about? God's concerned about the fact that every person has a soul. Friend, let's think about it in these terms. And this is really what James is trying to drive home. Don't be prejudiced in sharing the gospel with someone. Why? Because each and every person has a soul. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God said, Let us make man in our image, and in the image of God He made them, male and female, He made them. Genesis 2, verse 7 records then that God breathed in the man the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Each and every person, regardless of the language they speak, regardless of the color of their skin, the color, whatever it may be, they have an eternal soul that is going to live somewhere forever, and we should never hesitate to take the gospel to someone based on those things alone. Now, James gives us an example that was prominent in their day and it's recorded in James chapter 2 verses 2 through 4 concerning the rich and the poor. He uses this illustration. He says in essence, let's just give an example. Let's say that in your assembly there comes in a rich man and you pull out, you roll out the red carpet for that rich man and by that we mean, James records, you say to him, uh, sit right here in this fine seat or we pull out the best place for him and we want him to sit right here by us and give him that special place and then you've got another man that comes in this man he's not dressed in fine clothes and wearing nice jewelry and not somebody you really like to work, rub elbows with rather this man's dirty he just got off from a hard working job and he's dirty he don't smell as good as you'd like for him to smell maybe uh, what do you say to him? You say, stand here in the back or sit here at my footstool. Get out of the way in essence and don't touch anybody and don't bother anybody and let's try to make you as invisible as possible. The rich man, we want to elevate him. The poor man, we want to lower him. And James will say, that's contradictory. Who is it that's oppressing you? It's not the poor people, it's the rich people. Who is it that are receptive to the gospel? Those who were poor were the ones who followed Jesus many times. And so the basic principle is this. Rich or poor, doesn't matter to God. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Galatians 2 verse 6, unlike Peter who played the hypocrite, we're not to be prejudiced and God himself is not a respecter of persons. Acts chapter 10 verse number 34 clearly teaches these principles. Now, God has chosen the poor of this world the same way He chooses any of us, the Scripture teaches. More often, the focus is on the spiritual matters. Poor people don't often trust in their riches as much. They're looking for something more than what's recorded and what we have in, in this earth life. 1 Timothy 6 verse 8 tells us not to trust in riches. They can drag us down so much. And do you remember? Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. Think about that example that Jesus set in order for us. The rich fool had a great crop year, said to his soul, Soul, you've got many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry in essence. What would God say to that man, that rich man, who trusted in his riches and not God? God said, you fool. This night will your soul be required of you. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse 19 following. You've got Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man fared sumptuously. He had everything he needed. Lazarus is there eating like a dog at his table almost. He wasn't concerned about spiritual matters. Is, it, is the Bible trying to say that a rich person can't go to heaven? No, that's not the idea at all. But he's emphasizing that those who aren't as attached to those who haven't rooted themselves deeply in the riches and cares and pleasures of this world, 
they're open and they're often receptive to the gospel. They're rich in faith and they can be heirs of the kingdom of God if they will obey the calls and the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then as we mentioned, James says, what you're doing doesn't even make sense. You're honoring the rich and the rich is the one who oppress you. They're the ones who hurt you. They're the ones who put you in jail or prison. Why are you honoring them? Honor those who are receptive to and obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, here's the major point that James tries to drive home. All forms of prejudice and partiality are eradicated, are done away with by the royal law laid down in James 2 verse 8. Notice what that law said. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. How do you deal with partiality and prejudice? You've got to love your neighbor as yourself. Friend, the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark chapter 12, 30, verse 5, verses 30 following, and the second like unto it. Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. What's that mean? I've got to realize my neighbor, the person across the street, the person who may be hardworking and poor, I've got to love them just like I love me, regardless if they're the same color as me, regardless if they've got money or not, regardless if it's somebody I might rub elbows with in a social circle. That doesn't amount to anything. What really matters is, do you love your neighbor as yourself? Don't you want to go to heaven? Don't you want to one day spend eternity with God? That's the motivation. You've got to stop for just a minute and put yourself in that person's shoes. Love them, see them as a soul, and strive to share the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with them. That's what practical, real Christianity is all about. Now, friends, let's realize, and we really want to drive this point home, as kindly as we know how to say, let's realize that prejudice and partiality is a sin. Look in James chapter 2, verse number 9. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. If, if we are hesitant to take the gospel to someone, if we're not as kind and as inviting to people into our assemblies because they don't talk like or dress like or look like or act like we do, friend, we've committed sin. That's against the will of God. And as we said, it's against the will of God because God created man in his own image. When I think or speak badly, about someone who I may not like based on certain external features, that person's creating the image of God. I need to be very careful. God made them just like He made me. And in the kingdom of Christ, Galatians 2, verses 26 through 29, there aren't these classes. There aren't these hierarchies. There aren't these areas where somebody's above somebody else. You're all one in Christ Jesus. So, so let's realize that is contrary to the will of God and we must, we absolutely must be faithful to the Lord and live true to Him each and every day of our life. Now, let's turn our attention then to the words of verses 12 and 13 and, and this is really the idea. I, instead of being partial, I need to do unto others as I would have God do unto me. Look in verses 12 and 13. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to the one who shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What's the point here? I want to do unto others as I want God, not them, as I want God to do unto me. Well, I'm going to be judged by the perfect law of liberty. How do I want God to judge me? Do I want God to be a, a hard, an angry, a prejudiced and partial judge? Oh no. I want God to be merciful. I want God to be gracious. I don't want God to look at the exterior. I want God to see my heart. I want Him to know that I've strived and I want the mercy and grace of God, no doubt, to prevail. Well, friend, if that's how I want God to do with me, the Bible says we need to do the same. I want to be kind. I want to be inviting. I, I want to be open. I want to share the gospel with anyone, regardless of where they might be or what they might have come from. We need to have the heart of God who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, 
as James thinks about this idea of real faith, not being prejudiced, not being partial with the gospel, putting our faith now into action, James then deals with the idea that faith alone can't save a man. Look at James chapter 2 and notice the problem in verse 14. James says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? Now, this is the idea. The major question here is this. Can faith alone save a person? The context of these verses, it, it's the idea of faith and its application and living it every day as a child of God. And so, can someone be saved apart from works by faith only? That's what James is trying to discuss. And so faith, as we've said, that's my belief and my trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3 verse 5 do I trust in the Lord with all my heart, lean not on my own understanding, but do I acknowledge Him in all my ways? Now, as we talk about works, let's realize that in the Bible, there are a couple of kind of works that are mentioned. There is meritorious, what we often refer, as, often refer to as uh, meritorious works. That is, works of merit. By that we mean works that we could say, if we do certain things, we could look up to heaven and say, God, I've done this, you owe me salvation. The Jews did this at times. They said to themselves in John chapter 8, because we're the seed of Abraham, we're destined to be God's chosen people. And Jesus said, God's able to raise up seed Abraham from these stones. Don't save yourself. We've got a Abraham as our father. They thought just because they were Abraham's descendants, they had it clinched. They had it taken care of. That they were meritorious works. That's not what James is trying to discuss here. Rather, James is discussing a type of works known as conditional works. John chapter 6, verse 29 teaches us about these works. For example, belief itself is a conditional work. John chapter 6, verse 29, they have asked Jesus, what must we do that uh, we may work the works of him who sent us? And Jesus said, this is the work of God from God that you believe on him whom he sent. A work, what do you mean? It was a conditional work something they had to accept and do and live out in their life. And so when James talks about works here, he's talking about conditions, things God has set forth. For example, John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, are we going to say when we keep God's commandments, when we look up to heaven and say, God, you owe me salvation, I did it. No, we're still saved by the grace of God. But must I keep God's commandments? Must I meet those conditions God has set forth? Absolutely, and that's the kind of works that James is discussing in this context. Now, here's the example that James is going to draw up. I want you to think about this for just a moment. James says, here's what I want you to think about. You say you've got faith. Somebody says they've got works. Well, let me give you an example. Just imagine that a brother or sister is naked and destitute of food and daily clothes, uh, clothing and food and the things he needs for this life. You say, God bless you. I hope you get a hot meal and warm clothes and have a good day. Is that real faith? Now, friend, I want you to stop and think about that just a minute. Somebody come, Imagine somebody coming into the church house and they said, I I'm hungry. My family and I are hungry. We're cold. Can you help us with some food and clothing? And you said, now, I would if I wasn't a faith-only Christian. God bless you. Have a good day. You see, the person who says, I've got faith only, it's impossible for that person to do anything to help them if he just is trusting in his faith. And so James says, is that real faith? Notice James chapter 2. I want you to hear these words, verses 15 through 16. James says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Have you helped that person? No. What's the point? Verse 17, don't miss these words. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Friend, you can't say, I'm a faith Christian only. There's no such thing. Faith and works go hand in hand in the Bible. And how do we know that? Jesus said it. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus clearly said it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. Well, who is? He who does 
the will of my Father in heaven. It's not enough to look up in the sky and say, I believe in Jesus. That's faith only. Jesus said, that person's not going there. Who is Lord? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? and do not do the things which I say. Can you really call Jesus Lord and not do something? Not have some type of action or work in your life? Of course not. To really call Jesus Lord, you must do what He says. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 clearly says, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Now, the counter-argument this person gives in our context, verse 18, the individual is now thinking to himself, well, okay, some of that may sound good, but I'm a faith Christian, you're a works Christian. James asked this question in James chapter 2, look at verse 18 following. James says, if someone says, or someone will say, you've got faith, I have works. Here's his point. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my word. Someone says, well, I'm a faith Christian. Okay, prove it. What do you mean prove it? Well, prove it. How could you prove you were a faith Christian? If you do anything, you've got works. And so what James is trying to get them to see is this. Simply say, I'm a, I'm a faith Christian. A faith is all you need is a contradictory idea. Prove to me you're a faith Christian. Well, if you prayed, if you helped the needy, if you evangelized, if you obeyed the Bible, you've now entered into the area of meeting conditions and we're not just standing in the camp of faith only. In fact, James will say, faith can only, our faith can only be seen by our works. You say you're a faith Christian, prove it. Now let me show you this, he says. I'll show you my faith by my works. How do I know someone is faithful to God? How do I know someone's li really living for Jesus? How can you know that someone is a child of God? Look at their life. Look at their actions. Look at the way they speak. Look at the things they do. Look at their good deeds that they have in their life. They're not doing that to earn salvation. That's not what we're saying, nor is James saying that. Friends, you can't prove your faith without meeting the conditions set forth in Scripture. Now, classic example, and I love the example James gives. James says, now wait a minute. Let me show you what a faith-only type of faith is like. Look in James chapter 2, verse number 19. You believe there is one God, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. Friend, I want you to listen real carefully. James says that a faith-only type of faith is a demonic type of faith, and if all you do is believe on the Lord Jesus, you're going to have a front row in the seats of hell along with all the demons. Why? Because that's a demonic type of faith. You believe there's one God good for you. The demons even believe and tremble. What's James saying? It's not enough just to say I believe in God. It's not enough just to recognize a fact. James is teaching you've got to do something to show that. Now, here's the example. Look in verses 20 through 23, and I want you to see how Abraham proved his faith by his works. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect or complete. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham faithed. Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Who's the person in the Bible that Scripture says believed God and was the friend of God? Did he have faith? Yeah. How do you know? God said, Abraham, all the promises are coming through you, through your seed. You've got this one son, Isaac. It took a long time and a lot of work to get him here. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take him up on Mount Moriah, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. What did Abraham do to prove his faith? Abraham said, Yes, sir, God, if that's what you want me to do, let's pack the horse. Let's me and Isaac head up the hill. I'm going to do it. Hebrews 11 tells us why. He was so convinced in the promises of God that Abraham knew that if he killed his own son, God would even raise him from the dead. How do you know Abraham had faith? Well, it wasn't enough just to say, Okay, God, I believe you. 
Abraham had to load up his son. He had to walk that long trek up that mountain. And he took his knife and he was ready to do it. Do you think Abraham just believed? Faith only would be as disrespectful as you can imagine to the example of Abraham and to God himself. Well, what, what's the lesson then? Here's the idea. James chapter 2, verse number 26, kind of solidifies the point. The Bible records, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. What's a faith-only type of faith like? Like that body laying over there in the casket. It's dead, it's inactive, it's lifeless, it's profitless, it comes to nothing. Good for nothing in that. That's the point. James is saying, if you want to say to yourself, I've got faith only, you're like a dead body lying in a casket, good for nothing. Well, what is the point then? James is teaching us, you've got to put your belief into action. Don't just stand up and say it, do it. James chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now, here's one of the major points we want to drive home. We left this verse in the context for a purpose, and I want you to notice it now. James teaches us this lesson. James 2, verse 24. The Bible says, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Friend, I want you to listen real carefully. I want you to make sure you don't miss this point as James is speaking to us. The only time in Scripture the words faith only ever occur, did you know God says it won't save? Now you let that sink in just a minute. There have been a multitude of religious leaders who said that all you got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus and have faith only. And the only time faith alone is ever used in the Bible, God says faith alone will not save. Friend, be sure. Mark it down. Scripture teaches faith alone is not going to get anybody to heaven. Do I have to have faith? Don't get me wrong. You've got to believe in Jesus. Real type of belief, though. Belief that motivates one to action. John 8, 24, you've got to believe Jesus is the Son of God, so much so that you're willing to act upon that belief by repenting. Acts 3, verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn that your sin may be blotted out. Having repented, make the good confession. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father. And then, then friend, take your faith into action and do what Peter said. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. What's James 2 all about? Faith and works go hand in hand, like a hand in a glove. Faith and works complement each other. Let's each of us strive every day to put our faith into action and follow Jesus faithfully. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.